Thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to thank you, Professor Von Brown, Professor Janetti, and the Council for inviting me to give this talk here. It's always an honor. And uh, we heard a great talk from Professor Hell about imaging molecules at this level, in particular time dynamics, what, we, what the future does to us. He told, told us about kinesium we can do. I'm going to tell something about related to COVID, about the power of theoretical physics and molecular simulations to understand the, this process that we, that we are talking about. So just to be on COVID, that's a very popular talk. We could talk about many other models, but that's sort of a great system to talk these days. Uh, let me just make sure I see it. Okay. I'm fine. Uh, I, won't, I will talk to you about two efforts we are doing on that. One of them is about the biophysical characterization of how the virus invades the cell, right? So what's the physical mechanism for it? It's a beautiful process. And if you understand this mechanism, that's going to give a chance of trying to create lots of other new therapies that are involved in that part. And the second part is some collaboration we have been doing with some physicians, friend of us, using our simulations to develop new vaccines that are spray based vaccines that live in room temperature and are very inexpensive. And we hope in the future we help to, to go for, for nations in a much nicer way. So just two topics, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Basically, if you have a look, uh, the first effort, how do you simulate the, spi the, the protein-based spike? That's the one that basically every, everybody knows that binds to, to the cell and make the, make the invasion to go together. And I will tell you a little bit about the mechanism of this, this protein. First, this protein has two parts, S2 part and S1 part. After this protein sort of bind to the cells, it's sort of cleavage, the S1 part. And now, you have this S2 part, that's the one that goes through a major conformational change, that in the end, this bottom part melts and this free energy used here is used to sort of to bring these membranes together. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the details of this transition. It's a beautiful thing. And I hope in the end, I show you a short movie that helps you to summarize everything I, I present on, on that regard. As you can see, this lower part here, there's this fusion peptide, there's these parts that come here and invade the host membrane your healthy cell, and they bind on it. And after they bind, this HR1 and HR2, that they call after repeat, they're just big repeats of alpha helices, they sort of bind together, and this energy released from that's what is used to, put, to bring the membranes together. So continue on this topic, and that's what you need is membrane fusion, and how, that's how the virus invade the cells and then and come together. So X-ray crystallographers, have been able to give the structure of this spike protein post pre and post fusion. We listen to Professor Hell. We hope this day in the future now we're going to start to see these motions real time of how these things are done, these big rearrangements. There's a big of 20 meters rearrangement of these proteins that tells you it's an enormous transformation that goes through the system and how we move in that regard. Now, simulate the system is gigantic. We can't simulate. So we come to our ideas of protein folding. That's an area we have been working for a long time and was all cited here. And the idea of protein folding is if you look at a protein on its native state, the interactions on the native structure tend to be much more attractive than interaction between groups that are not on the native structure. So that creates what we call this sort of folding funnel that tells you the more you come down, the more similar you are to the final end, your energy comes down. So I can develop now a very simple potential where I say, I start from S2 from this pre-fusion structure, and as it comes to the post-fusion structure, becomes more attractive and goes down. I don't go into the details of the potential, but you can do that. And when you add to the top of it, configuration entropy and hysterics, you have all these parts that come to the entropic barrier, the static barrier, and how the system moves down. But you create a very simplified potential that allows us to simulate this gigantic, this gigantic system. So with that in meds, what we call these all atom structural based models, you can actually simulate the system and we got a very, very, very nice result comes from the idea. As you can see here, here's your pre-fusion structure. That's where these membranes are bound to the virus. You have this part of what you call the head. This head is going to move away <coughs> from the virus and uh, is, is going to move towards the virus and this, what we call HR1, it's going to move towards the invited cell, and you're going to see better, and, and release these peptides to invade the cell. We only have three structures, but these structures allow us now to simulate the entire system, because I'm going to use this final structure as my native potential. 
to build my potential function here. As you can see, this has moved away, and so there's the HR1. So what happens during this process is that as this head moves towards the virus, it gets into a structure that gets trapped on that state and has to live on that state for some time because it moves too fast. It doesn't give enough time for what are called diffusion peptide, that is part in the end of the protein that goes out and binds to the cell, okay? And then if it gets trapped there, then the peptides can bind and after the peptides can bind, then this HR1 and HR2 can lock to each other and actually fuse the membrane, but pull the membrane together because the sort of the peptides are these anchors that are pulling the membrane to come together. So as you can see here, this head moves up, gets close to the virus, this HR2 comes down, and these peptides are down here. And now you stay down here for some time, and as you can see, you start with this free state, and the system now moves towards this cage state, as you can see on the situation here, hangs there for some time. During these times, the peptides are able to bind, and then afterwards, these pull away, and when the HR1-2 and HR1-2 and HR1 bind together, they lock into each other, you pull the two membranes together. Beautiful mechanism that comes from this potential and how this virus does. If you understand all these mechanisms and you can stop it any time, this is a fantastic way to look for new therapies to the system. Now, what happens is these proteins are actually bound by lots of sugars around them, what we call glycan. And the sugars you can see here, they're in brown around here. And there was a lot of discussion where people said the purpose of these sugars was what, by the, to fool the immune system to be able to identify the protein. <coughs> but actually what we learned is that these sugars are very important to keep that cage state. That's what keeps the system trapped on that state and gives enough time for the system to do. So if you could find a way of removing these sugars out, that transition would be so fast. And if the transition is too fast, you don't have enough time for the fusion peptides to grab the membrane and you do that. So that's one of the things we're working now with our people to see if we can find ways of playing with these glycans and the bind of the sugars that help into the system. What we showed that on the simulation is that basically, if you simulate the system, if you look at the states, it's just time, there's a time you stay trapped before the final transition. You observe that here on times, if you have the glycans, you have lots of very slow events. You can see on time there's a log scale, right? That you can have these things, the linear scale, but you have this tail of states that give enough time for it to trap the virus. If you don't, I'm sorry, if you don't, if you don't have them, then you don't have this, these low times. So the conclusion of it is that now, if you have these long times, you can see with glycans, you, you are able to come, you have to come at this about 30 nanometers, that's the distance between the virus and the whole cell. So you can see if you come on certain nanometers, you have no glycans, your probability of trapping is zero, almost zero. And the other one, you have a good 40% of successful events, and that's when the virus invades the system. So this creates this idea of this mechanism. That's a very nice mechanism. And as myself, doing biological physics for a long time, I always believe that's much easier to understand these things in a visual way. So I I go over to show you a short movie on that. So that's basic where I show the, the initial system here. Here's HR1, the glycans, and here's the head of the protein S2 before it starts. You can see HR1 is the blue part here. HR2 is the up here. You have the head domain, I told you about it. And basically here in light blue, or the, uh, in dark blue, or the, the, the peptide, the light blue that, that have to come down. So this is start to move. This head moves up. And you can see these peptides start to search for the host membrane, okay? And as the peptides come down, now you hit this cage state here, and that's where you stay trapped for some time. And you have to stay trapped there for some time so that these fusion peptides can actually go after your membrane. And that's what they do next. Now you start to see they start hitting the membrane, they start to hook your membrane down there. And as they they hook this membrane by coming this simulation, basically, you start to see 
they are going to hook your membrane, if you need this time, now your head starts to, to move away. You have this other part of the motion, the fusion filter search the holes, you trap it. Now you can have the zippering, and this zippering is where you get the enough energy. This attraction between HR1 and HR2, the field domain, is what gives the energy to pull these membranes together. And now you can have the full invasion of the protein. So this is a very nice situation where you can do the simulation. And you imagine if you can do all the imaging that now Professor Hell was telling us about, you can see that the world is, is coming to a very, very nice uh, way into, into the simulation. OK, so on my last five minutes, I want to tell you about a different topic. It's what can you do now in a much more applied? So this part here, let me just summarize. If you understand this mechanism, you can see there are many ways on these glycans, what are these parts, if I create molecules that interrupt this motion, or if you can make molecules that make the motion to be too fast, they don't have enough time for these things to hook, then your system cannot, cannot bind. Now, together with some friends of following Rutgers, uh, some physicians there, we said, can we just collaborate in orders of doing vaccines? And we know the problem of vaccines this way on COVID or actual fine. And uh, one of the things that we say is basically, we are going to create a vaccine that divides this piece of the spike protein to learn. That's what I call epitopes. Uh, the system uh, we're going to simulate and see what we, we, which which of these epitopes work better. And if we identify these best epitopes, we help the experimentalists not having to try every single system to go after that. So what's the idea here? Phages are small virus. But these are viruses in bacteria, so they are not going to infect humans. But they're great virus to carry vaccine. So they have been using on many, on many drugs for cancer these days. They have these phages, these small viruses here, it's like a cylinder virus. Here in the head, they have a few peptides that have been designed to bind to pulmonary cells. So they come in for spray, they go direct to pulmonary cells and bind. And now I can come in the middle of the membrane on the side of this phage, and I can put these epitopes of the spike protein. So I cut a little piece of my spike protein, I plug here, and I hope that my system is able not to identify and is able to vaccinate your system. Now, just to give an idea, this is a very known technology, it's a very safe technology, it's a very inexpensive technology. In our trials, these phages can live at room temperature, so you can carry them on vaccine. You can do it by spray. You could, in principle, spray on this room and everybody gets vaccinated. So basically, it's a very nice way of, of going the way. There's a long way to get there, but I think you're going to see in our trials these things are doing okay. What we have done with our experimental part, we have tried several of these epitopes, and uh, we have been tried on mice, and based on their case, this is the protocol just for our experiments here. They give a vaccine in the first day, they have a vaccine after two weeks, second dosage, and we measure the level of immunity. Antibodies build into the virus, into the mice after, after five weeks. So as you can see is now, how do I know if epitope work? The problem is, when I cut this little piece out of the protein and I put on the surface of the phage, I have the question that is, is the structure of this epitope maintained? Because that distorts, it's not going to work. So how do I figure out which epitopes are good and what epitopes are better? So what we did is, you can see here, on this case, our first paper, we tried several, four different epitopes. Here are large simulations when they're cut out and they're put on the surface of the phage, and we're seeing their MST, the amount of distortion they have. And you can see from here that epitope 4 is much, much better. It doesn't distort anything. You can actually see from here, if you look at the distribution of structure, they're all less than two angstrom. From the final structure, and the other ones can go to eight, seven angstrom. That's a big distortion. So if you recognize that, that's not a good thing to create a vaccine, because they're, the way you see is not only the sequence, it's the structure that's important for the system. We did the simulations. We did the predictions, and then people start to do the experiments on the mice, which is for epitopes. And that's just basically, you can see these are initial results. You can see epitope four has enormous, much better response of antibody response. This is the two-week response and the five-week response. 
but you can see versus the other episodes how the system is doing much better. So we can now use this method in a very nice screening way of selecting epitopes and putting this thing. Now, phages are very inexpensive. So our goal now, and that's something we have a big NIH grant to start work on it now, is I can do like, for example, a mixture of many, many virus. So I can actually have multiple epitopes being together. So in terms of building a vaccine for us, is this population of phage, each one of them may have many epitopes, you have different variants, you can go to different epitopes that way. I'm almost there to that. Yes. And just as I did the other one, I'm going to show you a movie, just because to summarize what we did, I think makes life nice. You can see there's the viral capsid. The spike proteins are on the top. You can see how they are right up there. You see that now we have to select some epitopes, some small pieces out of the top of it. And epitope four, as you can see, is a very well exposed epitope, so it's very nice to respond. Another thing I can tell you, I have to get parts of the proteins exposed, right? So actually things can recognize. Here's epitope four, we did for all these things. So you can see now we put these things in the virus and we run simulations. Here's now the, and you can see from the simulations, here's just a cartoon, I can see how much these things getting distorted or not getting distorted. So does it keep its original structure or it doesn't? So you see the epitope four, Maintains it one way, so now they are on the top. You put them on the top of the phage, and now you have your vaccine ready to be delivered. Very cheap, inexpensive, and then, like I said, we have done this with our collaborators at Rutgers as one of the tools. So these are two examples of getting theoretical physics to understand uh, how how the systems work. Uh, with all the imaging we just heard about, we are in very good shape to do this these days, and. Uh, I want to say theoretical work was done together with Paul Whitford and Northeastern, uh, Vinicius, that a postdoctoral fellow in the group, and Steban, that's a graduate student. And also, I have to thank uh, Professor Vadiarapi and Professor Renata Pasqualini. They have done the experiments at Rutgers and, and put the story together. And I thank you for your attention. Um. A very uh, fascinating presentation. So we know that next year the, our president and chancellor will come with sprayers and uh, we will get uh, vaccinated here in loco in the uh, other uh, other pass. Very good. Thank you. So I'm sure that your presentation triggers many questions. Question: But what does determine the distance between in the first? part of your talk, the distance between the membranes, is this a given? Is it always the same in biological systems? Let me give you two answers to your question. Very good question. The simpler answer is the mundane answer is there's enough imaging of these days between the virus and the invade cells that you can measure that distance that's about certain nanometers, and people have that distance uh, well done. But also, you can also predict it based on the size of the spike protein. You can believe that you cannot have the cell closer than what the spike protein is. So that's a very interesting question because uh, you, as you observe, when you do this imaging, you can go to the beginning, you have the, I told you the S2 does the transformation, but the S1 is the one that binds to the cell. So you can measure this distance, S1, S2, and the cell, so that distance gives the number I gave you. But there's also imaging to do that. So another interesting thing is that uh, there are lots of spikes. There's not a single one. So when the cell gets around and you have uh, multiple bindings, you're not cutting every single S2 because you do that. These things go apart. So the virus is smart enough to keep a few of them bound just to keep the two things together on the disks I told you. And the other ones open apart. So these are these are the best things how you get this distance. Look at everybody. I'm a I'm a philosopher among the scientists here, so excuse this question. But as I was following your presentation, which I, I thought was fascinating, I was reminded of a line from Teilhard de Chardin when someone asked him about the problem of suffering. Why would God permit suffering? And he said, well, remember, when you're dying of cancer, the cancer cells are flourishing. And we shouldn't simply look at it from the standpoint of the human being. 
I'm watching your presentation and thinking, what an extraordinary display of beauty and intelligibility and order in the in the virus invading, you know, a membrane. And I just wanted to maybe trigger your thoughts or get some reactions. Uh, how do we approach that issue? Uh, I can tell you for a lot of people today, a major stumbling block to believe is the, first of all, science and religion, which I'll get to in my talk later, but also the problem of evil. Why would God allow this? I look at your presentation and say, what an extraordinary display of the divine wisdom and the direction of the universe, and that we can't simply read that from an anthropocentric standpoint of how it affects me. Anyway, it just it occurred to me, and I was just curious to know some of your reactions at this Pontifical Council for the Sciences as we look at that extraordinary display. So this is a this is a beautiful comment, if you think about it. One of the beauties about understand basic principles of biology is that how much the individual counts for nothing. Right? We love to believe we are all the center of the universe and we are so important, but actually the entire biology developed the survival of the species. And you as an individual are completely relevant as long as the species survives for a long time. And as you look at the system, the virus has all these mechanisms, but there's a very interesting story the virus does, right? Basically, COVID has this very enormous ability of invading. There are other viruses. We started this work in the past, didn't have time to do it. We were doing, the, for example, we were doing flu. That's how we developed techniques to do influenza. And the, this mechanism of transformation in these viruses are very similar. But what's interesting is that at one point, the virus has, wants to become very efficient in getting to your cell so that they can survive. As a species, although we may discuss if virus is real life or not, because they have to live as a whole. But at the other end, they also developed a way that they learn after a while, and you're seeing that on COVID, that you don't want to kill your host, because then it's not good for you. Right, basically, you want to invade a lot so you can sort of reproduce and survive. But at the same time, you want to create enough that your your host doesn't die. So you, you as a species, do it, and you can see the new variants of COVID are becoming less and less infectant. In a sense, that basically, basically, we have less disease or, or weaker disease associated with that. But I think all these mechanisms, as, as you observe, is really how these species live together and how they survive and not how individuals survive that's completely relevant for biology. Slowly moving from maybe this presentation also to the general discussion, if I can add a comment on your very good um, um, observation, uh, Archbishop Gallagher. Um, if, in my field, if you look at the um, fundamental constituents of matter, so what we call the elementary particles, and the fundamental laws of nature, so, which govern the forces like the electromagnetic force, the, the strong force, and the weak force. As the physicists in this room or on Zoom know, these forces are deduced, are born from principle of beauty. So, uh, are obtained by asking that the physical system is invariant under um, symmetry transformation. So, it looks like nature as beauty and aesthetics at the very, at the deepest foundation of its existence. And the other amazing thing is that we do exist uh, because this beauty and this symmetry is not a perfect symmetry, but it's broken. So it's not really the absolute beauty, but it's a beauty with some little defect. Otherwise, we will not be here. For instance, the matter antimatter asymmetry in the universe, the Higgs field, those are manifestation of broken symmetries. So, sorry, I closed the parenthesis, but I, I wanted to, to mention this in, in, uh, in this respect. Professor Bagnato. Well, thank you, Joseph, for the nice lecture on this uh, bio structural biology. I have a kind of elementary question. It seems to me that your simulation is like an in vitro experiment. But when you go to real life, which is equivalent to an in vivo experiment, we find a lot of different things that may influence, like the main field of all the other molecules around and everything. How that comes? I mean, how can you consider that, uh, you know, you are so certain that simulating single molecules and the attachment of the virus you can extrapolate to the real life? I think that's a very good question, basically. That's a question I have got in all my life and almost every problem we do. 
basically, Professor Hell was talking about protein folding. Basically, there are a lot of questions people say, how are you studying protein folding in vitro? What it has to do that with protein folding in vivo? That your question is well taken here. I want to step back a little bit to your answer and tell about the beauty of the self-assembly of biology. Okay? If you look at these things, it's like these molecules are able to reorganize themselves on their own. The same way as protein fold, they are able to to do that. So clearly, there are some effects in vivo that you can tell. We can talk a lot about them as, as we go along, as these things get there, how they avoid to aggregate, how they don't bind the wrong partner, how they do all that. And that depends on concentrations. That depends on how many viruses have a solution. You can put all these numbers. You can put the numbers of how many of these molecules you need to actually pull a membrane together. These are all numbers to come together. But the base mechanism is just built into the single molecule. That's one thing we learn about protein folding. One of the things about these biomolecules is their ability of doing these things alone. Right? So, for example, if you get any protein, small protein, I'm not going to be large ones that may be problematic, but any proteins more medium or small size, if you build that out of the body, okay, and you just do that sequence in the laboratory where you, and basically, Frances Arnold can tell more than me that she's building different proteins all her life in a very successful way, uh, and you build these things that never saw biology in life, you put that on physiological conditions, they fold exactly the structure you see in the cell. So it doesn't mean there are not other effects in the cell, but it means that this ability of self-assembly and this ability of this motion becomes very important. But these other things are important, and basically, but is this mechanical transformation that's required is part of the process. You cannot survive without that particular transformation, and that's what we hope interval therapy is to say, if we can interrupt it, we can do it. For most of the systems based, the people do vaccines, they try to come to the recognition site. Antibodies that avoid recognition. We believe that we stop the mechanical part. It's something that basically the system is going to be much, going to, be, going to have a much harder time to build resistance. Because that's not something the virus are used to protect themselves. There you, they remember that all these things come antibodies on the recognition site. So if we can build the mechanical part, we may do something future. That's the area where it goes. Yes, please. My question is more practical than philosophical, but it, it's just about the practicalities of the very elegant uh, dual phage display system that you described. So, um, how scalable is that process? How expensive is it? Is it appropriate to provide science and solutions for people in? poor country, as well as in wealthy. Your question is fantastic and right to the dot. Uh, the success on the mRNA vaccine, we have seen for many times, is that basic, this technology was in place. So when people just built the vaccines, they didn't have to prove these things were safe. They, the first approximation, they were done. Uh, if you remember the history, they start trying to do vaccination against HIV, but the virus of HIV varies so fast that you're never even being able to build a vaccine, but then you had the technology when it came there. Uh, the phage technology has been out for a long time, it has not been used for a vaccine, it's very inexpensive, it has been used on a lot of cancer drugs and lots of other systems, so it's a very stable system, it's very inexpensive, surviving room temperature, so price-wise will be the perfect vaccine if it works. Right now, our people are trying to work on, on showing the stability of that, and, but these things take time because it's a complete new system to deliver. So in that regard, I think it is a great system, and we believe we can do. The second part we are trying to work is to show that basically just these epitopes are sufficient. Basically, I don't, I'm not putting the full virus. Remember, just put a little piece of the virus and, and, and look at their efficiency. They, they, they have shown a lot, of, a lot of early results on mice, but remember the, the joke that people say that basically we know enough to cure every cancer on mice, right? We're not sure we can cure every cancer in humans. So, uh, so the question is, there's lots of surprises, as Professor Boyato was talking about, when you come from one organism to another organism, you will be caught by surprise. 
But it is my belief, and based, I'm not an experimental one, our people based at Rutgers, we are, we are just collaborators on this big grant, they're the ones that are showing the, trying to start to do this sort of smaller, more small trials into, into humans to figure out the efficiency of the vaccine. But if it works, it would be a very efficient one because they spray base, so I don't have to use needles. I don't have to use anything, something much more inexpensive to go to place. It leaves at room temperature, Phages are very stable, and phage technology has been out for a long time. So we believe that something that should work quite well. Yes, please. Very, very, very nice uh, work and very nice presentation. But I was wondering, the work you are doing is taking us into the road of uh, greater sensitivity and greater specificity when uh, the problem of the virus now is variation and uh, variability that uh, is taking us or forcing us to go away from that into a wide spectrum type of, uh, of uh, activity. How is that work going to help in that respect? Your question is sort of, uh, is the nightmare of everybody in, into this field, uh, but I'll be glad to address as much as I can about it. So let me tell you about the first part. The first part where you look at the mechanical transformation of the virus, we are very interested on that. Because if we look at the variations, the variations become on this virus becomes much more on the region where the virus bind to the host on the, on the recognition site. We hope that if we can get things that affect the mechanical transformation, that particular step when HR1 and HR2 comes together, if you're going to speed up or stop that, that's going to be universal to every virus. Have we got there? Not yet. It's not basically, we have been trying with small molecules with very little success yet, but we hope that we can do that maybe with a larger system. So in a sense, what we need to do is, and by understanding this mechanism, is actually to try to hope to be able to find some conserved mechanism for all these different variants, and that's what we are after, and I think the mechanical part is a good target for that. Have we have been successful or not? No, if we had been, the situation would be much better, but we are really on the understand, understand the fact. About the vaccine, what we like about the phage vaccine is that in principle, you don't have to have a single phage. You can, do, you can modify many phages. So in a sense, you can have a soup, an ensemble of all the different phages there. And our hope is that if this becomes the fact, we can put more and more epitopes in there. And you sort of, you could, you could sort of, uh, adapt to new variants as you come along. And basic, and you should put all them together in the same soup. There's another thing that remains to be tested. How many things can you do and not, basically, you put too many variations, is your immune system will get confused. So there are lots of things here that require much more serious work than just me saying that can put mixture all these things together. But that's the hope as we move along into that direction. But your question is very well taken. And that's basically the nightmare we all have about uh, multiple infections. Approaching the end of this session, I don't see any other hands. So let me maybe wrap up with a couple of, um, of remarks, uh, covering actually both of our sessions. So first of all, we learned this morning, and we'll see even more later on, uh, about the importance of fundamental research. Of course, here I'm teaching to the converted. But you know, those of you and those of us who every day have to fight to get funding, and, and we have to demonstrate the impact of what we are doing on society, an immediate impact in the next month, next days, in next years, I think it's important that we continue to underline this. And the fact that fundamental research really reflects it as all kind of research, how our most intrinsic features in human beings, our curiosity, our creativity, and our wish to understand how things work, from the universe to microorganisms, etc. And so already, per se, this deserves support and funding. But also because of the potential application. This morning, we have seen uh, uh, general relativity at play in the first session, in, in this session, quantum mechanics at play. And, uh, and you know very well that when they were uh, discovered about a century ago, they were considered useless knowledge. Uh, I don't know if you read a very nice paper written by a US educator, Abraham Flexner, who is one of the founding fathers of the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton, 
The title is The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. Please have a look at that visionary paper written in 1937, 1939, where he argues for the importance of fundamental research. We will not be here today, we will not have all our gadget without quantum mechanics, uh, without uh, general relativity. So I think it's important that we continue to, to fight for fundamental research and for the most, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the best uh, feature of us as human beings, as creative and curious beings. The other thing that emerges, and we know very well from, uh, from the sessions today, uh, we know that today's challenges from health to climate change are global, they are complex, and they are interconnected. So the only way we have to address them successfully is through cooperation. And cooperation, cooperation between different fields, cooperation between different sectors, public and private. You know, when you see these instruments, Gaia, for instance, is a strong, is a strong cooperation also with industry, of course and cooperation across national borders. And I think that we have also to, to fight for this, uh, for this concept and for making sure that, uh, that really society goes in this direction. And science is a very good demonstration that we, what, for what we can achieve when we set aside our differences and we focus on the common goal.